Income tax 2023-2024, marginal and average tax rates example problem. Get ready and some coffee because we're looking to get the tax man off our back with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our example form 1040 practice problem using LACERT tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to tax software, it could be a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the actual forms and instructions at the IRS website irs.gov, irs.gov. Our typical starting point will be that we have our taxpayer, Adam Taxman. Adam Taxman is of course trying to avoid a dang tax man or tax woman. And we have the social security number. We've got the address. We're in Beverly Hills, 90210. I just use that because of the old show that no one knows about anymore at this point in time. We're not focused in on California taxes. We're focusing in on the federal income taxes. Next, we have the filing status, noting that in the future, we'll go into each of these line items in more detail, but we'll just point it out now because it will have an impact on our current discussion, which is the average tax rate versus the marginal tax rate, a crucial concept to understand just in general. So we have the single filer, we've got no dependents at this point in time, and then we have the first section of our formula income line, which is of course broken out into all these different kinds of different income lines. We'll talk more about that later, but right now we're just gonna imagine the simplest income of W-2 income, the 60,000. That rolls down to the 60,000 here, so that means that we have the total income of the 60,000. We have the standard deduction, which we'll talk about later uh, at the 13,850, and that gets us to the 46,150. Uh, so when we're talking about the actual tax calculation, note we're not typically talking about them being applied to the gross income, but rather to what you can think about as net income or the taxable income, kind of like the bottom line of the income statement when you have this weird income statement, which is the tax formula equation. Then we're gonna be thinking about the rate that will be applied, which of course won't be a rate, but instead be something like these tables, right? So we've talked about these tables before, which will differ based on filing status. This is a summary table. We can look at more detail about these tables by looking at each of the brackets. Uh, with, with the more detailed information the, the reason this is useful is because then when I go up to a new bracket, for example, it'll give us a kind of a, a quick calculation of how the tables are working so that we can see uh, the tax that will be calculated. Meaning here, for example, it's telling me this is the 1,100 from the 10% bracket plus 12% of everything in the new bracket up over 11,000 up to the, the ceiling of 44,725. And then if I go to the next bracket to 22%, we can see now it gives me this 5,147. The 5,147 would generally be the thought process would be, well, that's gonna be the 10% of the zero up to 11, 12% of the 11,000 up to 44,725. That's where they're getting this 5,147. So it makes it a little bit easier to think about how the tax is gonna be calculated in the current uh, tier. But obviously to have this added line item from this line item where you have all of the filing statuses up top, you have to have a different table for each filing status. So this is the single versus the married versus married filing separately and head of household. So we'll talk more about the statuses later. 
Just want to point that out for now. Now, many tax softwares actually have a calculation uh, in, in a tax summary format. Let's go to the second page here first, and let's see the tax calculation. Here's the tax that's being calculated. We can uh, look at a worksheet here, and we see basically the tables being applied, the 10%, the 12%, and the 22% for the single filer, right? The single filer, the 10, 12, the 22, and they're within this tier. So that's going to be because they made 40 uh, 46 of taxable income. So they're within here, highest rate at the 22%. So if we were to calculate that, you could see we're going from 0 to 11. So the 11,000 times 0 0.1 is the 1,100. And then you're going to go from 44,725 minus the 11,001. Uh, so that's 33,724 which is taxed, they said 33,725, but that's tax at the 0.12, which is the 4047. And then the difference between here over that peak of 44,725 up to the 95,375. So the difference of these two. So we'd say then that's going to be the 95,375 minus the 447. Actually, no way to say the total taxable income was 46,175 minus the 44,726 gives us the 1449 about. And then I'm going to multiply that times the highest tax bracket 0.22. And that gives us our 319 about. And if we add those up, 1100 plus 4017 plus 319, we get the 5466. So you can see this could help you to kind of try to explain this uh, to a client on what the actual taxes are being uh, calculated are, although it's often useful to do some kind of average type of calculation to do that. So we could go and close this out. And a lot of times, a lot of some, a lot of tax softwares have a tax summary, which is basically going to be a, a formula type basis. We'll mirror this formula in Excel as well. So we can kind of break down each of these line items. But there you have your wages again up top. The 60000 was earned. We have the deductions. We're taking the higher of the standard versus the itemized. And then we have our taxable income, 46150 uh, That gives us our tax before credits, the 5466 So then if we look at our actual tax, and I'm not really looking at the penalties. I'm looking at the total tax. I could say, okay, well, if I have the 5466 divided by the taxable income 4615 we'll hold on a sec 46150 that's going to give us if we move the decimal two places over an effective tax or average tax of 11.8 percent so again notice what's happening here i'm taking the tax comparing it to the taxable income not the gross income right if we were to compare it to the gross income before any deductions, you'd say, okay, then you had the 5466 divided by the gross income, 60,000, what was actually on your W-2, you're going to get, you know, a, a lower rate, right? Because you have the deductions in there and everybody gets basically a standard uh, deduction. So then of course the highest, so that's, that's the rate that you might use this effective rate to try to explain to people, well, based on the bottom line, after the deductions that you had, then you have like an average or effective tax rate of the 11.8. And they might say, okay, great. I think I'm going to make 50,000 more dollars next year. So I'm just going to assume that I'm going to pay taxes next year of 50,000 times uh, times 0.118, right? And it's like, well, no, because, because first of all, there's brackets involved. And so you might end up with different brackets, but you're starting out at 22%. So the next dollar you make next year will not be taxed at 11.8%. That's the average. That's the one in the middle. That's just to explain what is happening. You're going to be taxed at the marginal rate, the rate of your next decision. Your next decision is made at the margin at this point in time, taking the next step forward, like going up a step of stairs, right? You're working on the next step and the next step is at 22%. So if you make, if so, if you make another 50,000, you're going to be taxed at the 22% or let's say another, you know, that's, so that's the general idea, right? So if I went 
if I increase the tax over here, we can say, okay, what if I went to uh, wages of 100,000 and go back on over? So now the, the ordinary uh, tax uh, bracket is the 22% uh, and the effective tax rate, they're calling it the ordinary income uh, tax bracket because it's, you can also break out ordinary income versus the, uh, the like different types of income for capital gains, for example. So in essence, this is gonna be your ordinary income marginal tax rate, your highest tax rate, and this is your effective tax rate. They're using you know different terms, but this is gonna be basically your average tax rate. We'll, we will throw in more complexity into this scenario when we have other things that are taxed at different rates. So when we get into uh, dividends, they could be taxed at a different rate other than the ordinary income. Capital gains could be taxed at a different rate other than ordinary income, and that can throw a wrench into the system. Let's say we go up to, uh, to 200,000, we'll say. 200,000, to do, 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 And then we're gonna say, okay, so now the ordinary income tax bracket, the marginal rate is 32% at the high, at the, at the peak at that point, And the effective or average tax rate is at the 20.6%, uh, right? And that makes sense because if we look at our table here, we're at the 32%, we're at 200,000, so that we're in between here for a single filer. Okay, so now if you, if you put in a spouse, Notice what happens to these tables, right? You would think they would all have to double because it's possible that you have two people that can make the double amount of income. Now, this has been something that's changed over time because it used to be that you had, if you think of in terms of a single family, uh, a single income family home, then that's not often the case where things just double with two people because, because one person might be taking care of the kids and, and stuff like that. So, but... In theory, you have two people now together, and if we treat them as kind of separate entities and whatnot that have the potential to make the same amount of money, then then you would think you'd have to double all of these, and you kind of want to do that in order to not disincentivize marriage. And this is where it gets kind of complex on the tax code uh, in terms of, well, if you change these brackets so that getting married is a disincentive, that that's going to have impact. People are going to act on that. Uh, you know, so that's kind of, so if, so you can see here that 11, this 11 goes to the 22 and then the 44 here goes to the, to the 89 and so on and so forth. So typically for the normal brackets, they kind of do the, the, the maximal thing, making it the most benefit to get to on, to get married, even though it's not likely that, that the income's going to double if a family happens due to the fact that most people, both spouses are probably not working full time, you know, in that situation. So it's actually kind of incentivizing marriage, at least on the higher income side of things. We'll see that on the lower income side of things, when we look at credits, the, the reverse sometimes seems to be the case. The credits actually work to disincentivize marriage. So it's kind of an interesting uh, dynamic on the higher income. When you just look at the brackets, it seems pretty, pretty driven towards uh, getting married being better in terms of brackets, which seems to kind of make more sense. But and then on the lower income side, when you look at the credits, it seems like uh, like there, there's actually a disincentive for for marriage, which is kind of kind of interesting. But we'll look at that later. So let's add a spouse then let's add a spouse. Okay, so now we've got now we've got Adam Taxman trying to avoid the dang taxman and Jane Taxman trying to avoid the dang taxman and 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 they're married. So now they're married on the filing status. We'll talk more about that later, but we're going to keep the income the same that it was just before we looked at that at 200,000. And so now you can see the standard deduction doubled, right? Which is because it was at single. We'll talk more about this later, but the 13,850 uh, times two gets us to the 27,700. So they maximized what you would think that the standard deduction would be doubling it. So, so, that, so now you've got the, those are like expenses, gets to the taxable income, 172,300. And then if I go to page number two, we've got the actual tax calculation. So we had double 
the expenses and the tax brackets were basically moved up, you know, d kind of doubling the brackets uh, as well. So now you're saying from zero to 22,000 instead of 11,000 is at, is at the 10% for 22 or 2,200. And then from the 22 up to the 89,450, then that difference is 67,450 is the 8,940. And then going from the 89 to the, to the 19,700 uh, is gonna be taxed at that 22%. So if I go back on over to the tax summary over here, at the bottom, we can see now the ordinary income, which is the average tax rate, is at the 22%, which is basically the tax calculation without this penalty of the 28,521 divided by the taxable income, not the gross income, but taxable income of uh, 172,300. And that gives us that 16.6. .6. And then the highest rate is is the 22 percent which which is you know big difference because of course again there's two people uh involved for this 200,000 versus when they were the single filer okay let's go back to the single filer and then just add, just add a little bit more complexity so now i'm gonna i'm gonna say they have w2 income but also they've got dividends so dividends have the potential of being taxed at a different rate so if I go to the to the forms again, same two hundred thousand. Now we have just Adam Taxman, and so and so the two hundred thousand, and now we've got qualified dividends. Now I'm going to say they're all qualified. We'll talk about that later. That brings the taxable income up to another thousand two hundred and one. Standard deduction now back down to thirteen eight fifty for the single versus married gives us the taxable income of the one eighty seven one fifty. Going to page two. The tax is calculated at 38,550. Now, if I go into this worksheet, we can see we have a much more you know complex worksheet here. You know, and it's like, well, what is going on? Well, this 1,000 right here is is throwing a wrench into the system because uh, it could possibly be taxed at different rates other than what we called ordinary income before. So, if I close this out and I go into, for example, uh, the tax summary and scroll down. So notice we have here the ordinary income tax bracket, and that's what they're trying to basically define because they're talking about you know ordinary income versus now you have income that is in that that is on the dividends, which may be taxed at different rates, and we'll talk about that later. But I just want to mention it now because it, because when you're trying to explain this to somebody, it's going to throw a wrench into the system because you can imagine with the tax planning what is happening is we're saying, okay, if you make more money in the future, you've got to think that you're going to be taxed at the 32. Or if you make less money, then you're, you're, you're still at the marginal tax bracket of the 32. That's the next step that you make. However, if you go into some of these other categories of, of income, such as capital gains income, then it might be taxed at a different rate if uh, it's a favorable rate because you have uh, qualified dividends or something like that. So, so that really throws a fair bit of complexity into the system now, because now we have progressive tax rates and then a whole nother kind of tax structure for certain types of income. And the same is true for uh, capital gains. So if you sell stock, then, then the question is, uh, how, much, how, much, how much income are you gonna have? Which is a calculation question in and of itself, because you have to subtract what you bought it for and then some of it might be capital gains. So if, which means it might be a whole nother rate, again, similar to the qualified dividends, the idea being that the government wants favorable rates on the investments to try to attract more investments in United States stocks, number one. And number two, w with regards to the capital gains, it's possible that those gains actually accumulated over multiple years so we'll talk more about the justification or why that might be the case later, but that's the idea. So, so which makes sense to, but it also is going to add a lot of complexity because now what's our, what's going to be the goal of the taxpayer who's trying to pay as little taxes as possible. They're going to try to lower their, their ordinary income to be at the lowest tax bracket and then take advantage of the favorable tax rates that might be offered from other types of income, such as possibly uh, dividend income if it's qualified, 
and and say capital gains. So if they can if they can categorize their income as a capital gain instead of as ordinary income and you're a high income individual, then it's likely that then, then you basically could have a significant tax impact, which means notice the more complex the code is, the more you're going to be paying people like accountants to try to figure these things out, to try to do planning where you can make that shift happening. The simpler the code is, the more people like me don't need to get that. You're not paying as much to like the, 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 prof the professionals to kind of try to figure that stuff out because it's easy. You don't need, you don't need to do that, right? So, there, so there's a lot of argument in terms of, are you actually gonna, gonna collect more taxes by making the tax code more complex? Or are you just going to cause people to take greater steps to, you know, try to legally uh, pay less taxes by doing more complex planning kind of thing? So in any case, that's that's the general rule with the marginal tax rate and the effective tax rate. Like I say, we're just looking at it from a conceptual standpoint right now. We'll talk more about each of these line items of the tax equation, income adjusted gross incomes uh and and you know the the deductions but for now i just want to note that usually what we end up doing is we end up calculating basically the taxable income and we can kind of visualize that calculation in our head because we can see the income statement but then we rely on the software to do the actual tax calculation and and therefore a lot of tax preparers don't have a conceptual framework of what the tax calculation is even though it's very significant and has significant impacts on planning in the future, because what we're doing is trying to just focus on getting the taxable income uh, basically uh, correct. But you wanna be able to, to kind of understand what the taxes in doing are doing and which tax rates are gonna be more or less favorable, ordinary income versus other types of income, so that when you get into the planning side of things and whatnot, what you should do into the future, you could you could think about the proper estimate of taxes that will happen into the future, typically looking at the marginal tax rate as opposed to the average or effective tax rate, and also thinking about the concept that you have different things that could be taxed at completely different rates that are not ordinary income rates, like possibly qualified dividends, for example, and capital gains, which we'll talk about in future presentations.